a couple things, but I'm going to deliver other content. So I'm going to talk about Start of Ignition, a boot camp uh, that runs up in Provo, but we're going to do the first ever version outside of Provo here in St. George in the month of May. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and then I'm going to grab a, a, a piece of content or two and share with you just to show you kind of what we talk about. We have hundreds and hundreds of things we do in an intense uh, boot camp short term, and we're going to really bring that short term and intense here in St. George over a couple days of very full days of 8 to 10 hours each day. So uh, we're partnering with Outlier, and again, where is ever? One more round of applause, because I think he's doing a great job, okay? Here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to uh, get a little street cred for just a slide or two so you think I know what I'm talking about. And then uh, I'm going to talk about Startup Ex uh, Ignition Express. And then I'm going to talk about founding teams and thoughts on how we find team members. Is that okay? Talk about that topic around tech entrepreneurship. With that, first message is, is that entrepreneurship can be taught. It's actually a skill. You don't have to be born an entrepreneur. You don't have to get lucky. Well, there's some serendipity that might smile on you, but it's not about just whimsical, magical wands making it happen. There's a scientific process, especially over the last 15 years, through academic research and studying the practices of tens of thousands of startups. There's been a scientific method to be successful in entrepreneurship that you can follow and quickly fail and move on to a winning project so you fail fast until you nail something and then scale it. And that's called the Lean Startup Movement. And that's the backbone of what we do at Startup Ignition. So this is an entrepreneurship boot camp. Boot camps are changing the academic world in lots of fields. We're doing it in entrepreneurship. Here's who we're trying to attract. We're trying to attract those that want to start a company, those that are in the middle of starting a company, and those that have uh, started a company maybe in the last year and it's frankly messed up and they need to fix it. We also have an interesting byproduct. We're helping people get better jobs because as they learn more of this stuff, it's kind of funny when they decide, well, I'm not gonna start a company right now. They go to an employer and they know more about how things work and they land better jobs and better pay. So that's some of our outcomes. A little bit about Start Condition Model is we take people through these type of things, the phases of a company. The first two are discovering validation. The big problem in entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs skip these two steps and go right into scaling. They think they've got a company on day one and they think they know it all. They're a special snowflake. They don't need to do any other work and they just start renting big spaces, buying equipment, doing all this stuff and then nobody buys their stuff and there's problems. We want to fix that pattern and get you on the right pattern. So with that, um, one other thing we like to focus on is the concept of nailing a business model because that's really when the magic happens. When you can prove to investors, potential talent and employees you're trying to recruit that you've figured out a repeatable and sustainable and scalable business model, your life can change. Things can really start moving in your direction. But that takes some work and knowledge on making that happen. You can do it. This process is how you nail a model looks complicated, there's a lot of steps, there are. You can hit your head against the wall and do it by trial and error over multiple years, or you can accelerate the process and follow good teachings and patterns and make years turn into months and months turn into weeks instead of the opposite, which is what happens when you do it the wrong way. Weeks start turning into months and months start turning into years. And I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about there. Um, okay, that's Start Mission Express. Here's a couple more things about it. Um, you can go to our website, startcondition.com, and read about what you'll get, how you register, and how it works. I just want to say once again to USTAR in the state of Utah, there's a program where there's still some seats left where they're covering 40% of this tuition cost. If you want to know more, talk to Ever of Outlier, and he, he can help you learn more about how to get signed up here for May and doing that. Uh, thanks again for the state of Utah. Oops, clicked too pass. Myself and my son Tyler are going to be most of the instruction in this program. My son Tyler, years ago, took my class at BYU. He stood by my side one year at Boom Startup, and he just did what I told him to do, which is he didn't do that most of the time growing up. But he did in this, and he started a company, and when he saw a pain, he saw a pain. There's not enough software engineers. Oh, let's get a program that trains software engineers. But Let's do it 
not through a university or a school or something like that. We're going to go get the best coders we know, and they're just going to do it right in the community and teach people. In three years, that company grew to multi-million dollars in revenue, and last May, he sold it with his two partners for $20 million to a big public company. And this is my kid, and if he can do it, you can do it. I promise you, okay? All right. This is my background. I'm an entrepreneur, an investor, educator, and mentor. Um, I've started companies. Uh, I was the first guy to put Yellow Pages on the internet. That company became Infospace and we went public in the dot-com era. Uh, as an investor, I've invested in a lot of companies. I have some logos up there of the real winners. There are many, many more logos of losers. I don't talk about them as much for some reason. And one of my greatest ones, you're gonna hear from them later today, is I remember the day I was on this I flew down from Seattle to Provo and walked into a second story dingy office on Center Street in Provo, Utah, and I wrote a $110,000 check to two students. That was a good investment. That company was amateur, and it was fun to see it a few years later go public, and then a couple years after that sell for a couple billion dollars. So that was a fun experience. And then I've spent time at BYU, other universities, teaching hundreds and hundreds of classes, and then uh, started things like Boom Startup, Utah Student 25, and managing partner of Utah Angels. So I got some background. We're going to run it May 12th and 13th. You can go online and see that. We're going to be hosted here. Where's you start? Thank you. May 12th and 13th, right in this room. We're going to have this program. So thank you for doing that. And uh, last thing about Star Ignition, this is the important part. A lot of people love the sexy, fun part of entrepreneurship, which is designing a logo, <laughs> putting marketing collateral together, um, sitting in your computer and not having to talk to anybody and work on stuff. The unsexy part is hard, the blocking and tackling, figuring out what the pain of a customer is and talking to many of them before you ever spend a lot of money building stuff, what they really want you to build. That process is important. We don't want just a Bugatti, pretty outside car that doesn't get us anywhere or go very fast or do anything. We don't want a car that looks good with just an outside wrapper and three flat tires and no engine. We want an engine that purrs and hums and gets us where we're going. And that's the point of startup ignition and what we're trying to do. Okay. I'm gonna talk about founding teams, give you a little piece of content, and I need a five minute warning, or a three minute warning, from somebody waving their hands in the back, so I can just share some information. This is gonna be just a sample of something we might talk about in Startup Ignition, so I'm gonna share about teams. So, first rule, and it's giving me two clicks at a time here, so I'm gonna go back. First rule is no lone wolf entrepreneurs. Massive research shows that single founder companies do way, 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 way worse than multi-founder startups. So if you're a single person starting a company, and especially if it's a scalable venture, where you have great plans for it to be with a lot of money and big someday, starting it by yourself is one of the surest ways to fail. And there is usually a cardinal rule list at most of the top accelerators and incubators in the world, and it says, our rules for admission, number one, no single founder companies, period. And they don't even think about accepting you, no matter what you're doing or who you are. So this is a really important thing. You can Google it out all over the internet and they'll tell you all the research and why that's true. The next one is diversity. Come on, go back. Um, diversity is a big issue. We've talked about it today. Diverse founding teams, by the data, greatly outperform homogenous teams, and that's a problem in Utah. Utah has a homogenous culture generally. That tends to produce homogenous founding teams. You don't need a clone of yourself on your founding team. You need somebody with different experience from a different background, challenging you, thinking a little differently. You just don't need another you. So make sure your teams are more diverse than you're potentially thinking. Lots of research backing that up. The last one is the composition of skills, and I wanted to talk on that just a little bit more. So let's go to that. What makes a good team? Well, at the bare minimum, you need a biz person and a tech person. 
So a two-person team, a minimal team, that's what we're looking for. I don't get excited if you come to me and you've got two business people and no tech person. And if you've got two tech people and no business person, that's slightly better, but still not very exciting. Okay? Now, we call this HHH small v. What's this? That's the three H's. That's the hipster, the huckster, and the hacker. And the visionary, potentially, or a little bit more creative visionary. But let's talk about the three H's. The hacker, the hustler, and the hipster. What we've got here is that it's very, very hard in one person to find those three general personality traits and skills and talents. That's why you need multiple founders. It's very, very, very rare. Matter of fact, so rare that it's hard to even think of anybody that you know that fills all of those roles. It's really hard. So we want to avoid trying to think we can do it all. Now, inside the coder person of the tech in a company or the hacker, there's also kind of three different skill sets that we look at. Back end, front end, and then UX, UI. It's also really hard to find one person really good at all three of those. Now, they exist, but they are probably making lots of money and can do anything they want to do. And it's really hard to get them to join your startup. So you're probably going to need more than one tech guy, not too late in the process of building a company. But what you really want to focus on at a startup is having that back in person who can build the core and the engine. Because if you just build the outside wrapper, you're going to have to try to farm out or get somebody part time. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And it's going to be a problem. So you need to understand those three skill sets. Now, front end and UX UI, that's the front end guy that does HTML, connects to the work, the back end guy. And then the UX UI, the user experience, user interface guy. Sometimes those can be the same person. And you might just need two people to fill this. So just some thoughts for you on building a team. Now, with that, I want to share this with you. This is a very important slide, in my opinion. If you take the three functions, having here a hustler, a techie, and a creative person in your company, whatever, when you start a company, the ideal situation over to the right, and you can't see it if it's too small, but if this is a person that's asking for no salary as a co-founder, they're working full time, they have no other jobs, and their ownership is significant, far greater than 10%. This is a person who's a franchise player that you can depend on on a team and really go the distance. This is the ideal. Having the whole team be that way is combustible. I've known many teams comprised like this that go on to greatness. If you want to look at the other end of the continuum, go to the left on the screen and you'll see, oh, they need a lot of money. Oh, they're only going to work part time. Oh, they don't have much equity. When you compromise from the ideal, what happens is you exponentially increase the chance for failure. So you have to be very careful about compromising. Saying, oh, I know I've got the greatest idea in the world and I'm going to have this guy you know, code for me two hours a week part time while he's working 60 hours for the man at a corporation. And it sounds really good and we talk ourselves into thinking it's going to work, but it doesn't work. It almost all of us collapses and crashes. Just last night, I spoke to a women's group in Provo, Utah, called Braid, which is women and entrepreneurs. And uh, a young woman that she, I talked to her, said, this is not going to work. You found a person at founderdating.com, but he's not willing to join full-time. He's keeping his job. I'm going to work for you in the evening hours. And she was, no, it's going to work. And so she almost had me convinced it's going to work. Six weeks into it, it's not working. So let me tell you some more stuff on that. Software development. This is a real email I sent to a mentee. And I'm going to read it to you part by part. So I went in and said, principal, this is somebody trying to say they need to find a coder and what are they going to do? Principal, the absolute best solution for a technology product is to have a rock star co-founder. Nothing is better than that by a wide margin. Anything else is best is a compromise. That threatens the success of your business. No joke. On a scale of 1 to 10, here are the relative value of each scenario. So the first scenario, ah, come on, don't click 2. Oh, it's going to click 2 on me. 
can. Rock star coder, full time as co founder, no salary, has 20 to 45 percent of the founding equity. That's what you want. Number nine, a rock star coder is a co founder. He needs a little bit of money. Modest salary, give him a little bit less equity. Him or her. Okay, that's that. Number eight, rock star coder is a key employee, not a founder, has some salary, gets some stock options. If your first main coder, by the way, doesn't have at least 10%, it almost always falls apart. They take off on you when a better opportunity comes along. Now, jumping down to five, I don't even have a six or seven, is when you say, oh, okay, I can't find a coder, I'm gonna hire a company to code my product for me on the side. Well, the reality is most people can't afford that. If you've got the money, this can work. It's gonna take a lot of money. The average is about $100 an hour for a US-based coder on a contracted basis. It takes a lot of hours to build products. It's gonna cost money. Most people run out of money before the project's done. And then you ask the next guy to come on, how do you wanna build on top of the half-done product that somebody else built? Talk to any software engineer, they'll never do it. They don't like building on top of half-done products. They won't understand what was done, especially if it was spaghetti code. Four, part-time coder as an employee, contractor, loose association, pay per hour, small options. This also doesn't work because eventually they find something better and move on. So it gets tough just to find somebody to do it part-time. Then number two is offshore coders. Doesn't work very well. I'll talk about that in a second. US-based, $100 an hour where you don't have enough money, that's the worst because you spend 20, 30,000 and don't finish your product. What I say here is anything below an eight will likely fail. I have spent about $1 million of my own after cash hard earned money chasing the India coder dream. It never works for me in multiple companies. I can't get it to work. I've talked to so many entrepreneurs, they can't get it to work too. So be very careful about that. Lots and lots of people, if you doubt me, I'll email me and I'll give you five people to talk to about it. So that's an issue. If you think you're special snowflake, It'll be interesting to see if you are. Last thing I set up for this person down here. If you come to me with a compromised solution and I acquiesce and let you believe you are a special snowflake, then you need to know that I have only succumbed and I do not believe it. I just don't want to fight you on it. That's my word as a mentor, okay? Because I've seen it too many times. All right, last thing on finding mentors. Uh, founding, founderdating.com and um, co-founders lab are two marketplaces and it's pretty active in Utah. You go on here and say, I am a biz guy, I've got this great idea, put yourself up, you'll get maybe in the first week like four people contacting you say, hey, I'm a tech guy, do you, I think, what do you do working on? So it's something that you can look at and that's one way to find people. Some other thoughts are this, turn over every rock, you've got to be aggressive, you've got to go where they are, you've got to hold events. At the beginning of each event, this is a tip forever, which is what I did, when you have 50, 100 people in the room say, who's a techie? Everybody, you know, to raise their hand. Everybody can go talk to them. Uh, entice them away from their job, it's really hard to do. Convince them you are the magic man or woman to make their dreams come true. You've gotta be a Pied Piper. And one last thing, you've gotta believe in what you're working on. They will feel it if you don't believe it. Yeah? How, how do you help them validate that? That is a fantastic question that I get asked every time I need to make a slide on it, so I'll answer the question. Thank you, John. The, que the question was, how do you validate that that person is really a good coder? And here's the only thing that's worked for me. I found somebody who's a really good coder himself and knows how to test if other people are good coders. And Every time when I'm going to interview and hire a coder, I ask him to do a 10 to 20 minute interview for me. He gets with the guy, makes him do stuff on the whiteboard that's really hard, so he can't baloney his way through. Because a lot of people tell you, yeah, I know React and Angular really well. And you're saying, awesome, you're hired. That night they're buying Angular for dummies and reading the book. And so, um, I have a PhD at a university, BYU, and he's a really good friend of mine, and he's interviewed many people for me, and he said, no, no, John, that guy doesn't know what to talk about. And then one time, though, he said, this is the best coder in the state of Utah. 
by the way, that guy that I'm just talking about works at Adobe right now. And he goes, he's really, really good. You could throw me 100 people, he'd be number one in every group I gave you. And I hired him, he gave him 8% of the company as like the third coder we hired. So that's how I knew. I have no idea to tell on my own. I have to find an expert to help me. Is that a good answer? That's the only way I could figure out. So one of the tricks in life was a biz guy in entrepreneurship, find somebody that can validate the coders as good as he says he is. John, all right, yes. One suggestion that, that I used to do all the time on that is I actually had my really, because I'm an okay coder, right, but I had my really good coder friend write like 10 tests based on which languages somebody said they were really good at. Yeah. And then I actually, so then when they have their resume, I would actually highlight, I'd have them rank, because they'd always write a few languages, oh, I know this, this, and that, and then I'd have them rank them, and then I would give them the test based off of that, so I didn't always have to go to that. Really, that's a good idea too. Let me tell you a quick thing that I found one time tell you why you've got to find a rockstar coder and how it makes a difference. I had spent $190,000 on India coders. Product wasn't even halfway done and it was supposed to be done at nine months earlier, okay? I'm reading the Daily Universe at BYU. Student threatened with expulsion for software. I read the article. The student had written a software application for when a class was full, he would snipe the minute the class became free. He sold 3,000 students his first semester a $15 license to the software. He made $45,000. And BYU's tech team was going, what the heck is happening to on our servers? Who's hitting our servers so much? because this thing's pinging like every microsecond to see if a seat becomes available and grabs it for that student. And on page 43 of the terms of use of the BYU website, it says, thou shalt not make any software application to manipulate this website. And since he was a student, they turned him into the honor code office and we're gonna expel him. What did I do? I hired him. I actually went into his defense and said, we're going to give him a prize from the Center for Entrepreneurship. I don't know what you're doing, uh, honor code. And, hopefully, and then they dropped the case. Okay, so what happened was, he was so, I said, how much do you want to be paid? He goes, $15 an hour. And I go, oh, no, 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 I think he thought it was going to go down. And I said, I'm going to pay you 25 because I'm so generous. Okay? Because I know too much from now hanging around me, you're going to know you're worth a lot more than $15 an hour. That kid has gone on, that was a few years ago, that kid in three weeks finished my entire product. One coder. The rule of thumb is one coder is better than four if he's a rock star. And so this is about team building. These are key components of making it with a tech company in the early stages. By the way, that young guy right now sits at a company I'm investing in called Four Up. He went to a software genetics company, was the rock star there, and then he got poached away by the founders of the company, and one of the founders was a CTO. He was over his head, and he said, this kid's better than me. They hired him, paid him 140,000, gave him a big stock option package. He's now the CTO of Four Up, and he's incredible. He's really, really good. Don't steal him, John. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so with that, um, one other thing, some biz guys, they punt and they go get the skills themselves. There's lots of boot camps in Utah. One is Dev Mountain that I talked about that my son did. Go get the skills yourself so you can tell and talk with coders more and hang around them and find them to get your stuff done. Lastly, one thing, if you are not progressing, then something is broken. If your deal is not going forward, it's not because the world is not nice to you. It's because you're doing something wrong or you haven't done something right. That's the real answer. If you're doing everything right, getting traction, and doing well in a tech company, there's unlimited amounts of money available to you. There's lots of it. So something's wrong if you're not getting funded. All right, now, broken. I have this, you can get these slides later. I have lots of ways you can be broken. That's a coder with a hoodie on, by the way. So. Lots of things, so, so many, so many more. I'm not gonna go over them because I got like 10 seconds or I'm over already. My last thing I just wanna say, come on, clicker, you can do it, uh, is that fix yourself. The scientific process works for entrepreneurship too. Lean startup is basically the scientific method from sixth grade applied to entrepreneurship. So when you do the lean startup method and do what you see on the screen right now and just follow this simple process, 
Magic happens because you're being disciplined and doing it right. You're failing fast, pivoting, and getting to a winning business model. I want to thank for your time, and I'll just leave um, I'll just leave my screen up there, but if you want to reach me anytime, Jay Richards at startupignition.com. Thank you. Thank you.